Don't be afraid of being wrong in order to be right. You see, sometimes in order to learn, you have to make mistakes. It's kind of like when you're walking, you know, you you probably thought you were pretty smart, you know, you were crawling around in your crib, you thought you were pretty slick and you know, how you're able to manipulate adults, you know, to get them to do what you wanted to, you know, when you were hungry you just yelled and got fed. When you were pooping your diapers you yelled and got fed. Well then then suddenly you thought, Hey, you know what? I, I kinda wanna do this walking thing, you know. So you decided, you know, to take it upon yourself and to get out there and walk on your own, you know. So you just kinda like decided to forego the hands and skip the little, you know, push cart. And you took a step, <laughs> was all happy, and then went bam and smacked your nose flat on the carpet, didn't you? Oh, you don't remember that. Okay, well, anyways, <laughs> just like a parent doesn't yell at the baby who's taking their first steps and learning how to walk, so too Christians aren't going to condemn you because you know you made a mistake in the first times that you step out and try to share or talk about or teach the Word of God or the Gospel. <laughs> right! Wrong! <laughs> if you've been a Christian for very long, you already know that people are waiting just to eat you alive. <laughs> They're waiting to tear you up, to, you know, snatch your joy and to shred your peace and to just destroy any kind of you know knowledge that you had because you blew it buddy <laughs> you're condemned well it's not supposed to be that way unfortunately sometimes it works out that way doesn't it now I know I know you know there's there's somebody out there that's bitter from the experience you know they're probably running around shooting off their mouth now because they're smarter and they've gotten to the place where they can defend themselves and their position and they can just like, you know, kind of slash and gash everybody around, you know, and make a dash for the high heels when they're wrong because they'll just delete your account or they'll get rid of you or they'll move you someplace where you can't respond because, after all, we don't know how to dialogue anymore, do we? Oh, but that's what Bible studies are for. You see, that's kind of why we have church. You see, you're supposed to be able to get together, you know, man on man, mano y mano, face to face, you know, kind of like do a one on one, you know, and say, hey, I want to talk, you know, what about this, you know, what about that, how about this, how about that, you know, and used to be in the old days, you got together with whoever it was, you know, and the two of you compared scriptures and you shared with one another, you know, say, well, this is cool, this is what the Lord showed me, really, wow, the Lord showed me this, and what do you think about that, you know, it's like, wow, well, I don't know, the Lord showed me this, and the Lord showed you that, well, that's kind of cool, you know. And it didn't matter whether it conflicted, <laughs> because we figured in the Jesus movement, if it conflicted, we were the ones that were in conflict, not the Lord, because the Lord was probably teaching them something he's not teaching me. You know, I might already know how to, you know, kind of like ones it or twos it, and you might only know how to ones it, and you're still working on your twos it. Well, <laughs> whoo, I don't want to be around when you're still working on it. But the point is, is that whatever it was that God was teaching you, doesn't mean you were wrong. It means you were learning and your learning curve was taking you in a direction that somebody else might have already been there so there's no reason to have an objection to what God is teaching you. You see, that's the point that I'm trying to make. What is God teaching you? Really? I mean, do you have to argue your position every time? Do you have to protect the integrity of the scriptures every time? Or do you pray first before you respond to a comment? Or do you think about what you're going to say ahead of time and say, you know, I'm just waiting for somebody to come along and shake up my apple cart so that I can stomp and make applesauce out of that person. Well, I, I'm not really in competition with apples, you know, or peaches or oranges. I'm more about what is God saying to you to do in every situation and circumstance? Because you see, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, as I'm always bringing up, you know, tells you to trust in the Lord with all your heart, you know, and don't lean your own understanding. So my first thought is, I, you know, unless my programming is really intense, which now it is, then I don't really want to lean on my own understanding. And even though I do have my programming really intensely revamped, I still don't want to lean on my own understanding because I would rather have a fail-safe program 
that underwrites all of my computerized digital hardware up here in my head and says, hey, just because you got the right answer scripturally doesn't mean it's the right answer spiritually unless biblically and scripturally and based upon what the Holy Spirit is doing in that person's life. You can validate and support the work that God might be doing to change someone in the way that he wants them to go. You see, there's all kinds of things that are occurring. There's circumstance, and this isn't like saying that you can reinterpret the scriptures you know, in order to fit your circumstances. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is God can do whatever he wants to do. And if he wants to use something you know, in the scriptures to pull someone somewhere or send someone somewhere or to take them someplace that they need to go, they need to stand on that promise or that scripture or whatever it is, the devotional or some personal feeling they have or some pie in the sky, you know, revelation that they got. And if they're willing to stand with the Lord, then the Lord will lead them. But you see, that's where we get into challenges, don't we? We really want to find out, are you sure? Are you positive? And, and, you know, that's a little strange there. It sounds a little weird to me, Abraham. I don't know, you know, I don't think you should be taking that Isaac character, you know, up on that hilltop. I mean, come on now. I see you got the wood. I see you got the knife. I see you got the rope. But I don't see you got no sacrifice, you know. And I don't know if I'm going to let you out of my sight when you're taking that Isaac. Because guess what? You just might want to kill that little sucker. And I don't think that's the Lord's will because God's not into sacrifices. But we know the end of the story that Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac. Now, did he? So you see, sometimes what you may see as really off the wall in the body of Christ, and believe me, I've seen some woohoo, goo goo stuff in the body of Christ that to me made me go, Dad, that's good for you, but I'm not going there. I'm not diving in that pool. You know, I'm sorry, but I see sharks, you know, and I'm not going swimming. But somebody else who God sends in there may have shark repellent on and they may be all fit for that pool that they're swimming in. But me personally, if I read the sign that says stay out of the water, I ain't going in. So what I need to do and what you need to do is always re-examine ourselves. We need to take to God what we hear from Him and then ask Him to show us how to apply what we think we just learned. A lot of times I used to tell people that's what Sunday afternoon was about. You see, I used to think that church was supposed to be Sunday go to meeting. You know, kind of like, you know, the old southern black gospel that I always heard about. You know, I heard that them churches, they got together, you know, and they had that little old Bible study, you know. They got together on a Sunday morning, the preacher would preach. You know, he wouldn't be teaching. Let's don't get this wrong. He'd be preaching, and he'd tell you about sin. And you knew you were in sin, because by the time you got done, you got to eat. You know, because, you know, after all, I work up an appetite, and that poor preacher, man, he was sweating, you know, and cursing and telling everybody how they go to hell. They need to repent. So by the time they got out from Sunday to go to meeting, there's a big old picnic afterwards. Everybody go home, grab their giddens and their goodens and their lickens and their finger-licking good chicken, and they bring it back and have food because they get along, and they want it to be a community, and they share together. And that's kind of what part of, you know, like used to be the Bible Belt, you know, they kind of like have a history of some really good stuff in their religion. You know, Baptists and some of those other guys that were down there, you know, that did all their thing, you know, and the black gospel too, you know, going on and all that stuff working together. It was pretty cool, at least from my perspective. Now, maybe they didn't like it and they were probably complaining because they didn't have, you know, air conditioning like we do, you know, and didn't have, you know, like texting like we do, you know, and didn't have cell phones going off in the service like we do. Huh. Or do we? So you see, I always thought that that's what it was about. Because then when you were eating the chicken, you know, kind of like finger licking good, you could talk about what the preacher had said. Now, oh, preacher, I want you to explain to me a little more about this thing called sin, you know, because here I am eating the good food of the table of the Lord, you know, and a banquet prepared in the midst of mine enemies, you know, and I want to rejoice and be glad in the fact of my salvation. So tell me a little more about what's going on. And he'd be, you know, eating away, you know, and then he'd tell and explain more what was going on from the sermon he taught. That's kind of what I like to do when it comes to learning the Word of God. You see, when I learn something, I need to see how to apply it in my life. Not just 
apply it like maybe a pastor told me, and like he says, hey, you know, you get this word, you know, about tithing, and you do this and that and the other thing, you know, then you should do it this way and blah, blah, blah. Well, then I'd be following his way. You see, God wants to make it the way. And the only way to make it the way is when there's no personal pronoun in it. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you put a personal pronoun there instead of the actual article, then you're kind of like personifying someone's opinion of it as opposed to the actual fact statement of what the reality of it is. Now what do I mean by that? I don't know. I got lost somewhere around the pronouns and articles. <laughs> yeah, I got you. You see, that's where people sometimes, based upon their own education, you know, that education stuff, you know, they get a little lost because sometimes people are talking like up here and they don't put it down here. Well, where the rubber meets the road is the fact of this. If it ain't for you, it ain't for you. So what are you doing with it? Don't tell someone else what to do with it. What you're learning might help someone if you can help them with what you learned. But if you're hurting someone with what you've learned, you're not helping someone with what you've learned. You get it? If it ain't helping, it's hurting. And you sure don't want to be hurting someone because, you know, kind of like that Jesus thing, you know, and as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me, and you reap what you sow, you know, so you kind of get this flashback from physics, you know, it teaches you that for every action there's equal and opposite reaction, so if you're going to go ahead and do this, this is going to happen, it's going to come back to you, and if you go ahead and hit them, they're going to hit you back, you go ahead and beat them, they're going to beat you back, you go ahead and stomp them, they're going to stomp you back, you'll go ahead and get a gun, they're going to get a gun, and you're going to shoot each other, and guess what? <laughs> it ain't going to work. Huh. You mean God don't want me to do that? You see, there's the point. What does the Lord want you to do? You having an interpersonal, just not one way, two way street with God, it's kind of like talking and listening. And then listening and asking questions. And if you're asking questions, then you're asking Him to answer them, aren't you? Now, sometimes people don't talk to God so well. I don't know. I personally can't get God to shut up, but that's just me. Oh. But you know, there are people that really have a problem with kind of like understanding what God's will is or reading about or hearing with their ears or seeing with their eyes or understanding with their spirit because, I don't know, maybe they aren't born again. Maybe they're not born of the Spirit. Maybe they don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But you see, that's the point. I don't know. But I do know who does know so I can go to him who actually has the answer for me. Because you see, that's kind of what James 1.5 said. It says, if any man lack wisdom, you know, wisdom, you know, that kind of thing that says, you know, if what you don't know and you want to know, you can find out if you just go to where you want to find out who it is that you want to know about because you can find out from the source from where it's going to be is that he's going to take you to the place that you need to be so that you'll be able to use what it is that he's going to tell you about what, was you on, what you wanted to know and who you wanted to know about. Uh huh. Well, that's wisdom, you know, because otherwise it's just stupid and gossip. But the point is, if you do it right, it's wisdom. So, really, if you want to get the dirt on someone, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. If you want to get the the scoop on what's going on, you ask the one who knows the heart and not just the outward things, and that's God. So, if any man like wisdom, he needs to ask God who doesn't beat you up for it or braids you for it or you know tells you you're stupid because you're asking him but gives to all men liberally. Wisdom. He doesn't give you just knowledge. He gives you wisdom, but you got to ask him. You see, you got to carry on a conversation. It's not enough to just simply say, like, you know, hey, Abraham, I'm going to go down and I'm going to wipe out Sodom. Really, Lord? you going to wipe out Sodom? Yeah, I'm going to take out Gomorrah, too. Really, Lord? You're going to take out Two for the price of one? Huh. Wow. Two for the price of one. Two for the price of one. Maybe I can negotiate with them. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can get, let's see, how many are in Sodom? How many are in Gomorrah? Let me get my iPad for a minute here. I need to compute this. Okay, tell you what, you know, if you're going to wipe out that many, what about, what about maybe not wiping them out and, you know, what if there's some good ones there? What if there's some good stuff left? What if, 
what if we could like you know kind of like get a return on our investment you know because after all the cities are kind of like you know been producing but maybe they produce some good what do you think will you destroy them if there's 50 well no okay not 50 well now we got a conversation go now we can negotiate god tell you what i'm gonna do i got a deal for you since you are oh so righteous and holy and perfect in all your ways and you're merciful and kind and you want the whole world to see what you're like what about the 20. <laughs> so you see abraham kind of got this idea of negotiating with god because he was carrying on a conversation with god jesus said it this way Man, there's an unrighteous judge, you know, and if that unrighteous judge has to put up with that sniveling, whining woman that's beating on his doorstep, constantly complaining about what's going on, will not that unrighteous judge also sit down and decide for and favor her case? Don't go too far with that parable. You might get distorted on what it really means. But you get the idea. The concept is conversation, communication. You know, like you and I, only we're one-sided because you're not talking to me, but I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Yeah, you. You know who you are. You, you know. So, in that respect of conversation, you should be having two-way, or is that all one-way? Two-way communication. You should be able to ask God, who abradeth not, but give to all men liberally, for wisdom. You should be able to trust God with all your heart, leaning on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, letting Him direct your path. That you should be able to hear from God, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, and they don't want to follow the voice of another. And you shall hear an ear, a voice in your ear telling you, walk this way, walk that way, walk this way, talk this way, yeah. You know, kind of like, you know, the song says, you know, walk this way. Well, God said bluntly that He would lead. God said he would guide. God kind of said he would provide too, and he'd kind of take care of you all the days of your life, but let's don't go there if you haven't gotten that far. But the bottom line is, he said he would talk with you, that you could hear his voice, that you could speak with him, and he would speak with you. Now, I know some people speak circumstances. Okay, fine. They're circumstantial Christians. Some people, you know, they take a Bible. Yeah, this is a Bible. This is one of my... My uh, Bibles I use for, um, actually it's the Bible I use to write my book, but <laughs> a few references I had to put in my book. <laughs> Quite a few. But the point is, is that some people, thus saith the Lord, you know, and God speaks to them that way. But God isn't deaf and mute and dumb in the sense that he can't hear, he can't see, and he won't speak to you. He will communicate in some way, whether to a donkey I'm glad I'm not showing a tail. <laughs> Scared me about my own personal reference says <laughs> that I have to put in my resume. But he can speak to a donkey, as he has. He can speak to prophets, as he has. He can speak to a lot of things and a lot of people, and he's done so in the Old Testament. And he spoke direct. But he can also speak to his son, and he has. And he can speak to his spirit, as he promised he would. And he could reveal himself, as he did to John in the book of Revelation. You see, God can do anything he chooses to do. And how he chooses to speak to you, I don't know. It may be a wide variety of ways. I've had God audibly speak to me. That was an interesting experience. It blew the doors out of my understanding. I've never put, bo put box in a God again. <laughs> no, I've never put God in a box again. As a matter of fact, it completely opened my eyes to a whole different universe. <laughs> Ooh, okay, Lord. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> now that I know this, I'm, pardon the expression, if some of you get out there offended, don't be offended, I'm screwed. Because <laughs> i got to deal with a living God. <gasps> oh, well. Thank God he extends his mercy and grace for me. <laughs> Otherwise, some of you would be wondering about me, I know. Maybe you still do. Pray for me. Pray for me. But the point is, this conversation thing that God and I have, you know, and you have with God and other people have, it can be a wide variety of ways. And at different times, different places, different things can be a different perspective. Jacob was shocked. I mean, shocked. 
dude, he was just blown right out of his doors, you know, literally, because he sat down and had a dream, and suddenly God said, watch this, and angels ascended, descended, and he said, whoa, I'm calling this place Bethel, because I didn't know the Lord was here, you know, and I think it's pretty sure it was Bethel, if I, my memory serves me correct, as I'm kind of rapping and chapping and, you know, talking about the Lord, but he said, I didn't know the Lord was here, but now I know, wow. And he made a little altar and offered praise and thanksgiving for it. You know, might even have killed a few animals. You know, uh oh, don't tell you know animal rights protection agency. But the point is, God communicated to Jacob in a dream, and at other times direct, and at other times through his promises to Jacob, and at other times through circumstances, and at other times direct, and sometimes even through the consequences of his own sin. You see, God communicates. The point is, are we listening? Are you listening? We all have the chance and opportunity to grow in the knowledge of God. Whether we choose to use those opportunities is our own choice. Personally, I like one of the choices that we have to make. That choice is to read the Word in the morning. You know, we can get into things like daily devotionals, you know, kind of like daily life, you know, it's just a bunch of scriptures that are put into little categories that, you know, this family did, they used to compare scriptures and they would speak to each other in songs and songs, spiritual songs, make a melody in their heart, to inspire each other, even as Malachi, I just heard today from a pastor that blew me away, that I was enjoying so much, that said that the Book of Remembrance was brought up in order to remind God and those people that were reading that Book of Remembrance that, guess what, these people spoke to each other about the Lord. Oh, wow, that's kind of cool. Does that mean Vidivo's going to be recorded? <laughs> Ooh, chalk one up for me, or two. But the point is, communication is the direction of what God wants to do with you. He wants to communicate so that you would cooperate with what He's doing so you don't alienate yourself from His salvation that He's provided for you to bring you to a place of oneness so to speak, unity, so to speak, or let's just put it where it really counts. He wants to give you a big hug, buddy, you know, and all you got to do is kind of get in with the program and you're going to get a hug from God. He's going to wipe away your tears and you're going to enjoy it. Huh. So there, imagine that, God hugging you. <laughs> of course, then again, if you understand the scripture, oh, that scripture, you know, word of God, you know, kind of like the Bible then, you know, if you're hugging somebody at church, yeah, you're hugging Jesus, and, you know, Jesus is hugging you, so you kind of got it there, at least temporarily, and much as you've done it to least of his brethren. <laughs> kind of get that picture? No? Oh, well. That's kind of why maybe some churches, people sit so far apart. They don't realize that if they're sitting closer together, maybe they're closer to Jesus then. I don't know. We kind of had these little goofy things that we used to do in the Jesus movement, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, shake another hand, shake a hand next to you, shake another hand next to you, shake another hand, shake a hand next to you, shake another hand to you. Jesus is a friend, he's a friend next to you, Jesus is a friend, do 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 do. Jesus is a friend, he's a friend next to you, Jesus is a friend, and sing la la la. You know, they were goofy. They were things that people say now is for Sunday school. I don't know. I just kind of left one church today, you know, and I think Sunday school ought to be in the Sunday service because we could do some with some little jump up, sit downs, kind of move around stuff, you know, to get closer to one another instead of just like, we'll meet at the coffee bar, you know, hey, let's go check out the fellowship over at the coffee bar, you know, but not in the service. Well, you know, kind of worship, you know, you could kind of like, you know, get a little closer together. You don't have to sit so far apart. Maybe some of you need to. Okay. But you see, God wants you, even the way you are, as you are, exactly coming to Him, presenting yourself to Him so that He can speak with you and you can speak with Him. He don't care how far you think you are, or He don't care if you stink, or if you smell, or you look funny, or talk funny. He don't care if you act funny. The only thing He cares about is, are you communicating? Are you getting the message? Are you understanding what it is he's trying to say to you? Because he's got a plan. And it's not just a plan for your life. It's a way to keep you from being misled into the false idea that, you know, you got to go to hell when the reality is you could skip that destination and turn it around 
to go the other direction, you know, kind of hitchhike your way to heaven. You know, I'm like a, I'm a hitchhiker. I'm kind of like waiting for that old gospel bus that J. Vernon McGee was talking about, and I want to hitch a ride on that gospel bus and get out of here. You could take a ride on grace, you know, and wind up finding yourself in heaven if you really choose to. But you see, that's only if you're listening. Are you listening? Are you hearing what it is it's God saying? Or are you listening to what people are telling you? Because you see, that's kind of what gets a little mistaken. If you are listening to what God says, then if people tell you something, you're going to say that God said it, aren't you? Hmm. That's why you have to compare things. That's why you kind of like, I enjoy not just the devotional time in the morning, but I also enjoy something we call church. You know, assembling together the brethren, you know, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, different people call it different things. You know, they call out ones in the true church, the body of Christ, this, that, and the other thing when they make up kind of like ways to get away with doing something that they don't want to do and they don't want to tell anybody else about so they don't want to be involved with anybody else because if they can just be alone by themselves, they can get away with what they want to do because they can reinterpret it into their own way of thinking. You really can't do that when you get involved in a church because you see, involved will make you evolve. That means you're going to change. You'll evolve from what you were into what you become. And God does that by kind of like rubbing off the rough edges that you got. Okay, maybe that I got. Okay, maybe we both got. <laughs> you got it, I got it, we got it. Don't look around, because guess what? It can be found in your own mirror. But as we rub on each other, you know, kind of like sitting closer together and learning that, yeah, you do need, you know, somebody. <laughs> I can help you with that. Trust me, I can give you some body deodorant. <laughs> yeah, then we can also help each other as far as not stinking thinking when it comes to God. We can learn how to understand better how God may have spoken to you so you could help me and I could help you. And then you could help me and we could help each other. Now, I don't know about you, but I, that's kind of what I see, you know, the, the idea of why you don't want perfect people in a church, but you want to be perfected by going to a church. You see, helping each other is kind of like what church is all about. It's helping to hear better, helping to see better, helping to know better God. God. You know, the big G. Well, that's what I like. I like being able to read his word, you know, and I'm not too bad at it, <laughs> although I get lazy. I like to study. Let's reverse that order. I like to read, you know, kind of like devotionals. I like to study his word, you know, kind of like Bible studies and stuff, you know. I kind of like to record, you know, and share and relate in a personal intimate way, my relationship with the God, my experiences with Jesus, the things that I go through every day, you know, and I post them and present them in a ministerial way. Who, not a mystery, but a ministerial way, you know, makes me a minister. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm just a normal guy. I'm a man with God, not a man of God. Ooh, big difference there. Be careful. <laughs> but my point being is that when I go to church, though, I don't go to get. I go to give. You see, I look around and I say, these people aren't singing. I'll sing louder. And they want me to shut up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I just went to a new church today, so <laughs> we'll find out whether or not they, you know, know who that loud mouth was. Shh, don't tell them it was me. <laughs> they might know where I live. Might write me an email. <gasps> but I love worshiping God. You know, I like singing the praises with God's people. You know, I love to enjoy the fellowship of His Spirit. I like to go and just kind of like forget about ourselves and, you know, just kind of like dance on the moonbeams or sunbeams or maybe it's just beams in the, in the, above the pews, you know, that I'm thinking of. Who knows? The light beams from the, you know, spotlights going on the stage. Well, anyways, you get the picture. I just like to envision all of us someday in heaven being with our Father. And it just takes me there, you know? So I close my eyes, and as soon as I can get down the words, you know, without having to look at the, you know, little scrolly thing, you know, I forget about it, you know, and sometimes I sing wrong. But that's the point. You can't be wrong in church. You can be right, but you can't be wrong, because guess why? God wants you, 
in your wrongness to be brought to the place to make it right. And that's kind of why we get together in church. Because we rub off on each other, like I said. We kind of like, you know, hit our knuckles, you know, sometimes. And we even kind of like offend each other so that we could forgive each other. We even learn how to, you know, not agree so that we can learn how to examine the scriptures and find out how to agree. We even find ourselves in places where we say no until we learn how to say yes, even when we still disagree. Because that's what Jesus said. It's not about being right. Sometimes it's about being wrong. But love covers a multitude of sins. And being silent sometimes means just letting the person be wrong and loving on them anyways. And that's what I like about church, per se. Because that's what my inspiration for going to church is, is to love on people. I want to love them. You know, I may not necessarily always come right and right up to them, and you know, because they're not ready for me. Believe me, if I let go and let God, whoo wee, they're blown out of the water. Let's get Pentecostal. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I am not a leaper and a what do they call them? Leapers and screamers, jumpers and thumpers. I'm not a roller and barker. You know, I'm not into barking. I'm sorry. Or laughing and I can't even think of something rhyming with laughing. I'm not a wacko and I'm not a weirdo. Yes, he is. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, he is. No, I'm not. He can't speak anymore. Now, that reminds me of some people I know. I guess I better check someone else out. What is it that I like to do? Want to have some fun? That's what I like to do. You see... For me, church is fun. It's a different kind of fun, I'll admit, you know, because I like dancing, you know. And I'm kind of like, I go out dancing every now and then with my wife. But church for me is fun. Listening to the Word of God, although I prefer to discuss it more than listen, but, you know, since the one half does the other, and there's a time and a place for everything. But, you know, I, I have fun at church. You know, I like to see what it is that God is doing in people's lives. I like to hear how he's changing them and rearranging their lives and bringing into their understanding a little more of himself. I like to see Jesus in the midst of his people because I see something different each time that I relate to him in my way as others relate to him in their way. And when we assemble together in all our ways, then as we acknowledge Him, He directs us as a corporate body because we trust in Him and we're not leaning in our own understanding. We're letting God huh, be God. And so I like church because then I can also be challenged by it. You know, kind of like these plants, you know, they're challenged by me because they, they got to depend on me watering them. <laughs> That's a challenge. Or me pruning them. Boy, good luck. Or me causing them, you know, to grow up into containers that are, you know, fit for their their climate and their. Here we go. Clip for the clip. Equipped for their climate so that they can grow up into becoming tomato plants and grow tomatoes. You see, that's what the church does for us. It equips us and helps us to become climatized for heaven, so that we are prepared for eternity. You know, I mean, it kind of, you know, does the same thing as far as getting us ready for ministry and going out in the world, you know, and dealing with all the other, you know, worldly things that you got to do, you know, kind of like putting up with each other and love and joy and peace and harmony and all that stuff, you know, about being a disciple. Padres, Domini, Spiritus, Sancti, whatever it may be. Woohoo! But, but, um, primarily, knowing God and then revealing God that's what it's all about. You see, that's what church for me is. Knowing God. Personally, intimately, in a more real way than I've ever known Him before. As Father, as God, as the triunity of the Spirit of God, or the Godhead, however you want to say it, you know, we get into all that. But you know the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But knowing Him intimately, knowing Him as Father, 
And then also knowing Jesus as Son of God, knowing Jesus as God, knowing Jesus in you and Jesus in me, knowing the Spirit of God as He's brought us all together in the unity of the body of believers. That's fun. That's my idea of fun. That's why I like church. Church for me is fun. It's not about the doing part that's so much fun, but it's about the knowing part that I enjoy. And the growing part when maybe hmm maybe I need to be pruned or maybe it's just my fingernails need to be clipped I'm sure you'll let me know or I need to change my attire because I'm not wearing the right clothes <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we help each other because the Jesus in you helps me become more like the Jesus in me. And as I see you, the Jesus in you, I want to help you be more like the Jesus in you as I see you as God sees you. Someone he died for, someone he cares for, someone he wants to live for, and someone who just might get blessed if they commit themselves to rest in his love in the place where God has placed them. Because you see, church, no matter how you look at it, no matter what you call it, no matter how you want to deny it, it is a container. It's a planting of the Lord. It's something God has put in this world to demonstrate His love for the world, to prepare those that are in it for going out to the world to be witnesses. It is the family of God getting together to have relationship one with another. It's getting to know God in a more personal, intimate way than you've ever known Him before. Because church is a container. It's just like the container your flesh is of the Holy Spirit that's inside you, changing you, rearranging you, and making you into the image of God until the day that you have a spiritual body. And so too, the church will have a spiritual body. It's called the body of Christ. That body of Christ, or body of Jesus, so to speak, will be the bride that's taken to heaven. And Jesus will rejoice over them with his banner covering them of love. And they will celebrate the goodness of God in a feast that's prepared for them, for the foundations of the world. And even now is being made ready as the call is going forth for many to come to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. That's what church is. Church is a container. And it's being just like the tabernacle was. It has become the tabernacle or edifice of God for the structuring of the saints to become more likened unto Jesus himself so that God would pull them out of the world into the place he wants them to be, which is heaven, which shall be to New Jerusalem. But you see, sometimes people are still seedlings, and sometimes they're still planted, Sometimes you still needing watering. Sometimes they still need growing. Sometimes they still need to be covered. Sometimes they still need to be placed in the sun. Sometimes they still need to be taken care of. And that's what church is. Not just a place to be taken care of, but a place to take care of others, even as you were taken care of when you first came to church. That's what church is. Church is what God intended it to be.